I guess we can start um, today's webinar. So like say, um, very nice to meet you everybody. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it cannot believe that, uh, that we've been, like I said, we've been uh, staying at home and then we have to, most time we have to host the webinar instead of in-person event. But one thing uh, about, a good thing about webinar, we got opportunities to meet people all around the world. We have registrations coming from, of course, from North America, from Canada, where we located, and from US. And we also see people coming from Europe, like Germany, UK, Poland. And we have people, uh, registration coming from Brazil, from South America, and also from the Asia part, from China. So all this actually, it's really exciting. So that at least that's one good thing about the webinar versus in-person event. So yeah, so like I said, it's uh, very welcome everybody. And today we are going to talk about uh, today's presentation. It's about new and advanced features in Jura service management. We will talk about uh, uh, what are the new modules are being added to Jura service management, and we will be focused on cloud version. I'm Irene, and I'm reading the Dragon Agile office here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Joining, joining me uh, in this presentation is also my team. So here is Alex. Chris, Hello. Hello. Justin, and uh, Megan. Hi. So, yeah. So we also have uh, our good friend and uh, a guest speaker, Powell, and uh, he is a vetted, vetted, really experienced uh, Jura and our our Atlassian users. And uh, today he will share his best practice and how he uses all these powerful tools at his work. Hello. Uh, right. So let's get started. So this is today's agenda. So first I will do a brief introduction about Dragon Agile for people who don't know us. And after that, we will take a look at some of the new features in Jura Service Management. And we will also look at the low map, Atlassian's cloud low map, especially about the Jura service management, what well, is coming up and what's already it's available now. And after that, we will dive deeper into uh, uh, some of the new features uh, in Jura service management. So my team has prepared some demo and the slides for that. And uh, following that, we'll be looking at what are the plans that Atlassian has to offer for Jura service management. And the power will do his, uh, will share his uh, best practice outer, uh, outer, outer, we look at the plans. And we will also be touching on the cloud migration options for Jura service management. Is it possible? How, how do we do it if we want to do it now? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And we, of course, have the Q&A sessions. And at the very last, we playing a little game. We planned a little game. We will spin the lucky wheel. We are going to give out eight uh, Skip the Dishes gift cards. OK, so let's get started then. Let's move to the next one. So about Dragon Agile, who we are. So some of you may already know who we are. It's, uh, um, for people who are new and uh, have never heard about Dragon Agile, I would like to do a brief introduction. So we are Atlassian's Gold Solution Partner, located in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Just like any Atlassian Solution Partner, we offer licensing, with added values, hopefully bring you better value services. And we help customers to implement uh, customizations, training, and the support for Atlassian products. And globally, 
we are Atlassian Platinum Solution Partner. We have offices here in Canada, Waterloo, Waterloo, Canada. But we also have offices in Shanghai, China, where we have a much bigger team and the majority team are located in that location. And we also have offices in Tokyo, Japan. So if you have any questions uh, about Atlassian products, feel free to contact us. I leave the two emails so you can contact uh, our Waterloo office or you contact uh, our uh, Shanghai team. Now, what is Jura Service Management? So back in October last year, Atlassian announced this new name, new brand. Previously, you, some of you may are familiar with Jura Service Desk, but now it's called Jura Service Management. With this new brand, there are lots of new features and the modules are being included to make it a unique solutions, Atlassian solutions towards the ITSM. So on the high level view, Jura Service Management it's aimed to unlock high velocity teams. It's meant to deliver value fast and make your work more visible. It also can accelerate the flow of work between your development and operation teams. We are going to look at a few examples. What does this mean? So here is one example. Atlassian, uh, in, in this new version, Jura Service Management, you may find lots of templates are being added. So the templates, it's, it's not just for IT service management, you will find the templates for such as HR services, project facility services, legal services, it'll make, it will make user much easier to create a project quickly. With the with user can select a template that is closer to what they need. And then the, once the project is created, it's ready to run with all the set configurations that match their needs. So that's a very, very nice feature, and it helps you to deliver your value fast. So next, let's look at how does this tool make work more visible? Here's one example. The screen you are seeing, uh, some people may not be familiar with because it's of genies. So in, in this, in this of genies screen, it's, a, it, it's investigating an incident. Within this screen, you actually will also see the information about the big bucket. Once the big bucket is integrated with Jura Service Management with Ops Genie, the recent uh, commits will be available on this. At the bottom, you can see the recent uh, commits. You can see uh, uh, all the commits uh, that causing may causing this incident. And once you identify which commit could be the cause of the incident, you can actually add the add to the potential causes and select the commit. So a screen like this will just make it work much more visible. So it will helping you to find the root cause of the issue much faster. Now let's take a look. How do we accelerate the development operations team and get to work more tightly and closely? Here is a screen. It's a, it's a screen from Big Bucket. I use this screen because uh, in, within the Big Bucket with the pipeline, a developer can quickly create a change request from within the Big Bucket without targeting to another application like Jura. They can just uh, raise a change request and that ticket will be create, created automatically in Jura and someone who needs to approve that change request. So once that ticket is being approved, it'll be automatically deployed. 
this would save developer lots of time because developer don't need to wait for approval. Everything is automatically so that he can quickly move to other tasks. So that's why it supports the point, it accelerates, making your development operations team to work much closely and faster. Now that being said, that is just the, some new features in Jura service management. And there is, I like this low map from uh, this page about all the cloud low maps. Here you can select on the left panel, you can select which module you want to see. If you want to see if that particular feature you are really wanting to be included in Jira service management, management is it the already be shipped or it's actually will be released soon oh actually it's working on it right now so this will be a really good page to give you all the information so i think it's worth to take a look there are lots of modules and uh, you may find some surprising uh, uh happy to see some features will be available soon All right, so we talk about the uh, low maps. Now, yeah, before we dive deep into the new modules, um, I would like to do a brief refreshment of what are the fundamentals in Jira Service Management, previous Jira Service Desk, before we go to, to learn the new features. So this, are, um, I, I provide a list of all the key components and the functions within Jira Service Management. So Jira Service Management, it's just like any Jira software, uh, software project. Once you create that project, it comes actually with extra customer portal. Customer can raise ticket from within the customer portal and the agents will see the tickets, but the agents can organize the tickets in a queue. So queue is a very good way to uh, organize whatever way you want it organized based on agent's name, based on the priority, critical, right? So or based on the, fun uh, the, the fun functional elements of your work. So it's very flexible to organize. And within Jira service management, you definitely can create a request type because customer can raise ticket in any area. So make a request type more user friendly, close to a customer needs. This is the customers. Uh, it, it made them life much easier and find your uh, ticket, raise the ticket in the right category. So that's a request type. And of course, as an admin, you are able to set the customer permissions. So customer permissions will allow you to allow uh, the Jura admin to define who can raise your ticket. Is your portal public or it's just a private portal? If it's a private portal, who can raise the ticket? You can define it in the customer permission. So now uh, customer notifications, you, Within this module, you can define at what event should customers receive notifications. Do you want them to receive notifications for any uh, changes, updates, or their comments being made, added in, or only at a certain events? So that can be defined. And SLAs. SLA is a matrix to measure how your team, how the agents, uh, performing their work, how fast they get to uh, work on a new ticket, and how long does does it take your agent to resolve a ticket. So that feature is available in Jira Service Management, and of course automation. It's a very good. I like that module. It, it make it just make a. Uh, it, it can streamline your work processes and uh, automate, reduce some repetitive tasks, manual uh, tasks. So it's very useful tools to use. 
and address service management and conference integration. If you also using conference together with Jira's service management, would just bring your experience to another level and also unload your agent's work. If you have a create, if you have lots of articles, useful articles created in your conference, like a how to knowledge based articles, your customers will be able to find those articles before they even raise the ticket. This will help them to self service to self serve and uh, resolve the issue by themselves before even raising a ticket. So it's a very powerful feature. Email request. We talk about the customer portal. Customer can raise ticket in customer portal, but customer can also just uh, sending email to a particular email address you defined and the tickets will be created and then your agent will be able to work on that. So that it's also available within the GIS service management. And of course, there are different workflows that matched different issue types because that will match to your different request type. Thinking about that change management, instant management, problem management, they may all have different workflows, which makes sense. And dashboard. Dashboard will give you a report and, and the overview of how your teams are performing. You can display the SLR, SLR SLA matrix, and you can uh, display the activities of your teams. Oh, the team member can go to the dashboard to find my open ticket. It's a place where you can quickly get uh, to get an idea and the overview how my project is going, how my whole team is performing, what are the critical issues. So yeah, so that's we talk about the all the fundamental things within the Jira service management. And now um, we're going to look at uh, new modules in Jira service management. Here, I will turn over to my team. Alice will be the uh, first one talking uh, more about automation. So I let Alex take over the screen. Hello, thank you for the quick overview of the Jira service management fundamentals. Irene, and let's get started with automation. So, so what is automation in Jira Service Management? Well, automation is a no-code rule builder that enables customers of Jira Service Management to create rule-based events. Rules allow you to automate actions within your system based on criteria that you set. Automation rules are made up of three parts, triggers that kick off the rule, conditions that refine the rule, and actions that perform tasks in your set. Rules allow teams to automate processes normally done manually to keep JSM issues and important information up to date. Automation also has built in integration with tools like Slack and Microsoft Teams, while also being customizable with other external applications. And for premium users, you can create global automation rules to automate at a scale across multiple projects. So who might automation be for? Since automation is of course a no code feature, this means anyone can build rules with just a couple of clicks. Automation is for teams that need help automating tedious and repetitive tasks so you can focus on high value work. It is considered a must have for adding logic and building automation rules for your service management project. And because automation is free and built in with every cloud instance, everyone has access to it through their Jira service management project settings. Quoting David Yu, a Jira admin at Lyft, Jira automation is indispensable. It saves my team a lot of time and building automations across all of our tools is simple and easy. So what are some use cases that automation can be used to solve? Well, let's say you want to keep up to date on issues. Then you can use automation to create a rule that closes parent issues and notifies the support team when a last task for a large issue is complete. How about if you want to surface potential problems before they escalate? Then you can create a rule to send a support team and SLA when an urgent issue is raised by the CTO. You can provide advanced customer support by creating a rule to reopen, assign, and respond to closed issues when a customer comments on them. And you can even auto assign approvers, teams, and link related issues when a new issue is created. With automation, all of these rules can work together to help save time and reduce overhead for your business. So this demo shows you how to get started with 
creating rules for your Jira service management, but we'll skip over it for today as the process is a little simple. So in our previous slide, we've seen some simple yet effective use cases for automation. But automation is capable of much more. Here's an example that showcases automation's advanced functionality. Say our user works with an IT vendor that provides issue resolving services to help solve customer issues. But they also use a separate Jira Cloud instance to track all of their assigned issues. The IT vendor wants to keep track of issues assigned to them by the user on their instance without manually duplicating each request from our instance. Well, we can actually use automation to solve this. Through the use of the send web request action, we can duplicate the issue onto their instance and remote link the two issues using the REST API as shown above. Keep in mind that remote JIRA instance issue linking will actually be added later this quarter to the JIRA issue view, but this example showcases the advanced functionalities of automation, such as the use of web requests to solve complex problems. While remote linking will be added as a default function, the duplication of the issue itself is not, and there will be even more advanced options we can use with web requests, such as waiting for the response data and using that to update our issues and even sending custom data to only send specific data within the web request so that not all information is shared. You can see above that we can also change the headers and the HTTP method type. And not only that, but we can also use automation to go as far as duplicating the work logs and comments when they are made on either issue to keep everything up to date. So another way automation can be utilized to help automate tasks related to change management is using some of the tools available. In the example above, you can see that when a deployment to production is made in our Atlassian Bitbucket, which is connected to our JSM project, automation can be used to create corresponding change requests to be tracked within the project. Furthermore, we can use automation to populate the fields of our change requests depending on the services affected as shown in the automation rule above. And once the deployment reaches the conclusion, we can then transition the request accordingly to match the request status. With the tools automation provides, you can even automatically add approvers according to the affected services bucket until the request is approved. Here you can see all the DevOps triggers automation provides for you to activate rules based on the many actions you can take in your development software. Selecting development and build triggers also gives you access to the build and development data through smart values, which you can use to update your issues and requests to be up to date all according to whatever the build and development data has. So for, for more information, you can check out um, popular automation templates and categories by visiting automation playground available at Alagian's website. There you can explore and edit hundreds of templates and create your own custom rules without an instance using the custom UI provided. None of the changes you make will affect the instance, so you can feel free to explore automation as much as you want. Now that we're done with automation, I will move on to alert and incident management, and I'll pass over the control to Chris. Thank you, Alex, for going over automation. So now I will be going over alert and incident management. So Opsgenie is an incident management platform that was acquired by Alassian in around 2018. Opsgenie allows you to manage alerts and incidents by notifying the right people in a timely manner. With over 200 integrations, Opsgenie can be used for many purposes. And for an example case is you can use Opsgenie to link um, to Jira service management so you can manage issues and incidents while also linking to one of either Slack or Microsoft Teams to allow team members to effectively collaborate with each other. Postmortem reports is another issue, is another feature of Opsgenie. Essentially, it allows you to improve in future incident resolution because after you resolve an incident, what you can do is you can create a report so that um, it gives information about what causes the incident as well as what steps can be taken to resolve the incident so that if the incident ever occurs again, responders can simply refer to the completed postmortem report to know how to solve the issue quicker. So Opsgenie is currently built into the Jira service management, IT service management project template. So in order to see this functionality, so you have to create a project and you must use the IT service management template. So after you have created such a project, if you look at the left sidebar, you'll see in the operations tab, there's services, alerts, and on call. So to access Opsgenie from here, all you need to do is click on alerts. 
and it would bring you to another page to show Ops Genie. So why should we use Ops Genie? Um, as I said before, it is already built in with Jira Service Management and has many different um, features that allow for good use of instant management. It also has the Operations tab in Jira Service Management, so you can quickly check what services are available, any alerts that need to be attended to, and who is on call to deal with these issues. It can also reduce alert fatigue for teams. And what this means is that, so consider that you have multiple different departments or teams, and they each have their own apps and systems and notifications, and you want them to collaborate. When they have to collaborate, they're going to end up sharing some of these notification systems. And this can mean that there's a lot of unnecessary notifications going to each team. So what Opsgenie can do is it can essentially take all those notifications and reroute it to the right people to make sure that not everyone's getting all the notifications at once. And also with all these different integrations, you can easily synchronize between many apps so that if you make one change in one app, you can, um, Opsgenie can make sure that everything else stays up to date. So now I'll be going over some common uses for Opsgenie. So the first one is going to be efficient incident management. So whenever an agent sees that there is a ticket with an issue that is really important, that is an incident, what they can do is they can escalate this incident and make a corresponding incident in Opsgenie. And then within Opsgenie, responders will automatically be notified of the incident. Responders will have a few options to um, collaborate with each other through an incident command center, which allows them to video conference with each other. They can update stakeholders as well as view um, more information about the incident. So the second use case of Opsgenie is consolidating and routing notifications. So as I have mentioned before, whenever there is some collaboration between many different teams and there are lots of apps and notifications, it can very easily get messy and end up um, uh, end up causing a lot of unnecessary alerts to team members and leave them confused and wondering what they're supposed to do. But Opsgenie can actually consolidate all of the information from all the different apps and then using things such as routing rules, they can route all the notifications to only the right people. So that instead of having your team members search through thousands of emails every day, they can get the notifications they need, such as um, urgent ones through um, a text message or SMS or um, um, mobile uh, push notification from an app, while less urgent uh, information can be sent through email. So another feature of Opsgenie is system monitoring and scheduling jobs. So in Opsgenie, there is a feature called Heartbeat. And what a Heartbeat is, is it's basically uses a system with REST APIs or emails to send information and communicate with an external system. So for example, a Heartbeat can be used to make sure to check that your website is still up every hour, or it can check whether or not a daily scheduled job such as a daily database backup has failed or not. And if it ever receives a bad response, or if Opsgenie is expecting a response, but they don't get a response in a certain time, then it can automatically create an alert to tell responders that there's an issue that needs to be resolved. So now I will be going over how to um, use Opsgenie and how to integrate with Jira Service Management. Although it is already integrated with Jira Service Management, this I'm going to show how to integrate it both ways and how to customize it a bit more. So I'm first going to start off by logging into my Atlassian accounts and I'm going to create a new project. So this project, I'm going to call it ITSM test. And it's going to use the IT service management template so that we can see the features built in from Opsgenie. So as you can see on the left sidebar, um, there is uh, the operations tab, which has services, alerts, and on-calls. And these are the built-in features from Opsgenie. So in order to access Opsgenie from this menu, all you need to do is click on the alerts and that should take you to an external tab. So the first thing you want to do with Opsgenie is you want to set up the users. You would go to settings, scroll down a bit, and underneath people, you can see users. So here I have already added myself as a user, but now I'm going to add another user. 
I will add Alex to the users. And roles determine how many permissions and what access they, each user has to the website. So for now, I'm going to give Alex the user role. The next thing you want to set up is teams. So let's say I'm going to create a new team and I'm going to make an IT team. This IT team, I'm going to add myself as well as Alex. Within this team field, we can see routing rules. So routing rules determine where and how notifications are routed, either using escalation policies or a team schedule. We can also add our own routing rules. I'm going to make one called high priority. So for example, if um, the priority is greater than moderates, which means high or critical, then I will route using the IT team escalation policy. So essentially what escalation policies are is how um, team members are alerted of alerts. So zero minutes or immediately when an alert happens, all, a, a certain on-call user in the IT team schedule will be alerted. If it's not acknowledged, then five minutes later, the next user in this team will be alerted. And if after that's still not acknowledged, 10 minutes later, all members of the IT team will be alerted of the issue. So then we have on-call schedules, which show the schedule of who is on call and what time. For example, you can see when I'm on call versus when Alex is on call. You can actually change the rotations by editing rotation right next to it. For example, we can change the rotation type to daily. Now we can see this change is reflected. Um, also, what we can do is add an override, which basically allows us to take over for a certain period of time when someone else is working. So for example, I wanna override when Alex is usually working. So I would just select the dates and then I would select the time interval as well. Yep, and now you can see the slot which shows the override and it shows up in the final schedule as well on top of the rotation. So now I will be going through each of these tabs after I show the notifications. So in notifications, you have contact methods which allow Opsheen to notify you in different ways, such as email, SMS, voice, or even a push notification if you install the Opsheen app. Notification rules define how and when exactly you'll get notified of things. So for example, I can make a rule that's just a test rule for notifications. If the message contains help, then it'll immediately notify me through my email. I can change this to be any other contact method that I have specified. So now there, we're going to look into forwarding rules. Forwarding rules allow you to forward your alert notifications to another user for a specified time frame. This can be helpful if you are on call, but you're currently dealing with an incident, so you need someone else to fill in for you while you're dealing with the incident. And we can see the on-call schedule specific to each user here. Now I will try and look through each of the tabs. So alerts, you can see what alerts you have. Um, you can see the save searches. And you can create your own alert at the top right. So I'm going to make another test alert and add myself um, as a responder. So if I refresh the page, I should be able to see the alerts. So here in the alerts, you can see I can do a few things such as acknowledge, close, um, also assign or delete the alerts. Clicking on the alert shows us more information about it, such as the details, the activity log, and the responder states. So I'm just going to acknowledge and close this alert for now. In the instance tab, once again, the menu is really similar. You can create incidents. And I will just fill in some fields right now, just uh, test. So you can add a conference page, which allows uh, responders to communicate to each other with video. And you can add, add responder teams and responder users, as well as stakeholders. So here in the incident view, you can see more information about the incident, such as the description, the impact of services, as well as post-mortem reports, which we'll come back to in a bit. So on the right side, we see details like uh, the Instinct Command Center to allow for video conferencing. 
Um, we can see stakeholder communication. We can just send updates to stakeholders with this. We can see any associated alerts, as well as the responders assigned to this incident. So on the timeline, we can see a list of all events that have occurred that are related to this specific incident. So let's just say that uh, I resolve this incident for now, and I'm going to see that it's in the resolve tab. But right now I'm more, more focused on the post-mortem report feature. So once an incident has been resolved, you can create a post-mortem report. What a post-mortem report does is it essentially allows responders to fill in information about the incident, such as what caused it, how to detect it, and what steps can be taken to mitigate it or prevent it in the future, and as well as steps to resolve it if it does happen. So as you'll see, there are um, fields such as faults, detection, root causes, um, as well as different prompts to tell you what you're supposed to enter in each of the fields. Now going to back to what is on call, we can see um, the on call schedules that are sorted by teams. If we click on it, we can see the team schedule I made earlier. So if we go back to teams, you can once again see the teams and make any teams if you want. The services show any services and the analytics tab is a bit more complicated so I recommend that you check the Ops Genie for more information. So now I'm going to go to the second part of my demo. The second part is going to show how to integrate Ops Genie and Jira Service Management both ways, as the default integration only goes from Jira Service Management to Ops Genie. So to start off, we're going to be at Ops Genie. We're going to go down and look for integration list underneath integrations. And we're going to search up Jira Service Management or just the first two words is enough. Now we just follow the steps to configure the webhook for Jira Service Management to Ops Genie. So the first thing we need to do is go back to Jira Service Management, go to System, try to find webhooks. Then we create a webhook. So I will call this webhook integration to Ops Genie. Going back to the tab, we can see that we have to paste this link into the URL field. So I just do that. And then I'll go back and see what the next step is. I have to check issue created and issue updated events and click on create. So if I scroll down, I can see issue created and updated. And then I can just create uh, the webhook. And now it has been op integrated. Uh, we can be more specific about what triggers and what events trigger what events from Jira Service Management's Ops Genie. But for now, we're going to look at integrating back the other way, where something like creating alerts can create issues in service, Jira Service Management. I want to check these um, different boxes as well. So one example of Ops Genie to Jira Service Management is if an alert is acknowledged in Ops Genie, then you want to add it as a comment to the issue in Jira Service Management. Now to actually set this integration up, well, we we're going to have to fill in some more fields. For example, if we create an alert, we need to map it to a specific issue type. So for example, I will choose um, the, the system service request issue type. For the Jira service management URL, you would just need to add your base URL of your domain. And if you're not sure what this looks like, there's it shows in the text here what it should look like. The username should be the email accounts that is both an admin for Jira Service Management as well as the Ops Genie. And for password API token, we will need to access the site to, for you to generate API tokens. This site is um, linked underneath this video in the slides. So I've already opened the tab for API tokens. Um, all I would really need to do is I need to click on create API token, give it a name such as test, and then I just copy this token and I paste it into the tab. So the last thing I have to specify is the project key because I need to know which project I'm integrating this with. So I know in this case, I'm integrating the project key that has IT. And with that, it has been fully integrated. So now I will cover an example use case that uses Opgenie and Jira Service Management together. So I'll give the context first. 
let's say that we are a company that um, has a website that allows users to log in and buy or sell goods. And let's say right now that I am a customer who uses this website and I notice that the website is down. So I decide I'm going to go to the help center and raise a ticket. So here in the help center, I go to common requests. This is definitely a system problem. So I write in the field that the website is down. But I need to specify just a little more information. So I'll say that I cannot access this site. Now in the affected services, I know that the company website is down and I can submit my ticket. Now let's say that I am now an agent viewing this issue for the company. If I go to the queues or the incidents, then I can see that there are a lot of other related um, issues. So I recognize this is a major incident. As such, I will create a major incident. I will verify that these fields are correct and I will set a priority. So what this does is it essentially creates an incident within off chaining as well. And with that will notify responders towards fixing the issue. And we can access this major incident by clicking on the linked major incidents. Alternatively, we can also access Opportunity once again, if we go on the left sidebar and look for alerts underneath operations. But for now, I'm just going to go back to the tab where I've clicked on the linked major incident. Here we can see more information about the incidents. As we can see, the impacted service is the company website. And if you have a Bitbucket integration, we can actually investigate the potential causes. Here we can see information about the deployment history, as well as the commits that have been made. If you suspect there are certain commits that are causing the issue, you can select them and add them as potential causes. And now they should show up right over here. So once again, on the right side, we, responders can create incident command center to um, communicate with each other, send updates, and we can also assign roles to responders. For example, I assign myself to be the incident commander. Now on the timeline, once again, related uh, events should uh, pop up. For example, the me assigning myself to be incident commander just now appeared. So let's say that I resolve this issue and I'm going to refresh the page. Uh, I mentioned post-mortem reports before, but what you can also do after you create a post-mortem report is you can actually, let's say I filled this in, but even though I have not right now, but what you can do after you fill it in is you can actually export it to Confluence. Essentially what you can do is you can make a, you can dedicate a knowledge base space just for um, post-mortem reports for Ops Genie incidents so that you know in the future, if there are any incidents, you can refer to the Confluence knowledge base to check if the incident has already occurred before and has been resolved. So responders can easily access any resolution steps towards fixing the issue. It also allows for users and other people to discuss what they can do better and what they can do to prevent it from happening again. As, as you can see, it shows up in the Confluence page. So now I will hand this over to Justin and he is going to be talking about asset management. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for telling us about Ops Genie and incident management. So I'll be going over the final new feature that today, uh, which is Insight Asset Management. Well, as of now, Insight is a Jira application add-on, which Atlassian hopes to be able to integrate more into Jira service manage management by the fourth quarter of 2021. So at a high level, Insight is a database that stores company-wide asset data. This can be anything from IT assets to human resource assets. And it also maps the relationships between these assets. Additionally, you're able to link JIRA issues and company assets. And this helps JIRA admin be able to track, manage, and use the different company assets and assign the correct people and the correct assets to any service requests within a portal. So the basic overview of Insight Asset Management is on three levels. At the top level, we have object schemes. This is the overall framework of assets being modeled. Looking at it from a Jira perspective, this is comparable to projects. At the second level, we have object types. These are groups of objects that share the same attribute types. This can be seen as issue types within a Jira project. And finally, we have objects. These functions as a single asset within a company or a instance of an object type within Insight. 
And these have specific attribute values that you can define. And this is comparable to issues or requests within JIRA. As of now, Insight is accessible through the apps header within JIRA. The home screen is actually the object schemas page. We can create new object schemas from the top right corner, but for now I will be going over a test IT object schema I've pre-configured. Going into it, we see on the left a list of all our object types. For example, we have the asset details object type. This tree hierarchy determines the relationship between these object types. In our example, we have asset details, and it is a parent object type of these object, these object types, for example, scanning information network interface. And for scanning information, asset details would be considered a parent object type. Looking into this second left sidebar, we see all the objects corresponding to a single object type. So right now I've selected the CPU type. In the brackets here, we can see the total number of objects corresponding to this object type. If we want to further search, we can either do a basic search or we can write an IQL statement in this search bar to further filter the number of objects appearing in the sidebar. IQL is the inside version of JQL, which is Jira query language I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. And finally, in this object pane, we're able to see the attribute details. And attributes are similar to fields within Jira, and they tell you all you need to know about each individual object. And additionally, down here, we can add comments. Here we see all inbound references, which I'll get into later. So inside is configurable at the object schema level. So in the top right here, if we were to click on this button, we could go into the configuration page. We have some general configuration options at the bottom, including quick creation of objects and allowing other schemes to reference this scheme. Here in the top headers, we see references and statuses, and these define the, the applicable values within the scheme strictly for the scheme. And I'll get into references and statuses later. Furthermore, we can configure rules, and this determines what permissions different Jira users have within Insight at a scheme level, and also automation, which helps streamline certain tasks within Insight specifically. Back in the object view page, we can see under object type, if we were to click on the dropdown, we can access the create button. The object create button is very simple. We simply have to put a name, select an icon, and then select a parent. We can optionally leave the parent to be none. Once we have created an object type, it'll appear in our left object type hierarchy here. And then if we click on the object type and this drop-down menu, we will again be able to configure the object type. So here is general configuration, and this is just where you can change the name, icon, description. More importantly, we can look at the inheritance. The first option, let the attributes be inherited by object type children, will allow any children object types to have the same attribute as the parent object type. Setting the object type as abstract will make it so that you cannot create any objects of this object type. Rather, you can create objects of its children type. This is similar to object-oriented programming. Back in this object view, we can see the Create Object button. To create an object, we would simply fill in all the attribute values. Only the ones listed with an, a red asterisk are mandatory. The other fields are considered optional. And now we're going to take a look at how to set attributes within an object type. So the default attributes that are created are the key, the name, created date, and updated date. Everything else is configured by the inside admins. So under type, we have five different types you can choose from. The default type, which has type values, text, date, time, integer, text area. So the type value determines what the inside user is able to input as a value. The second attribute type is a status. And we see here that the type value is actually blank. And that means any status defined within this object scheme or globally is accessible to the user when they create an object. If we want to restrict the number of statuses that they can define, then we simply select the ones we want them to 
be restricted to from the dropdown. And this list will include every status defined either within the object schema configurations or the global configurations page. The next attribute type is objects. And these link one object type to another object type. So the type value is the, is the object type we want to link this current one to. And then here we have a list of dependencies. And this will determine what type of object link we have. So in this example, we have that the ob application services object type is being linked to the network assets uh, object type by the installed dependency. So in uh, simple terms, this essentially means that an application service is being installed to a network asset. The third view we see up here is the graphical view. And this shows a list of dependencies between different object types. So in this example, we see that the CPU object type is a child of the asset details object type. And additionally, that it is linked to the host and connected devices object types, which essentially means that these have references to the CPU. And then furthermore, the connected devices is a subtype of the host as shown by these, this arrow. And they are both child types of the network assets. So this is a brief overview of uh, the basics of Insight an Asset Management. So next we're gonna take a quick look at Insight Automation. This is very similar to legacy automation within JIRA that you guys may be familiar with. And it specifically runs within object schemes. So the way this is done is first you set a trigger. This determines when the automation is run. Your options are objects being created, objects being updated, and then as well as comments being added and updated. The if condition must be the form of an IQL statement, which again will filter the number of objects applicable. And the then options are to update either an either update an attribute value or you can create a JIRA issue. Now we'll talk about how you can connect JIRA issues with Insight objects. So this is done through a three-step process. The first step is we have to create asset types within Insight. This is done through the asset, asset type configurations tab. Here we see that an asset type is made up of a name and an IQL statement. So the IQL statement I've chosen here is object type is in connected devices and the status is active. And this will act as a filter that we will use later on. Once we have the asset type configured, we're gonna go into the custom fields creation tab in Jira settings. In there, we're gonna create a new custom field with field type assets. This can be found in the, under the advanced tab in the left sidebar. Once we have created a custom field, we're gonna navigate to the specific asset field we just created. And in the three dots on the right, we're gonna select context and default value. This will bring us to a next, this will bring us to another screen And here we see under filters, we're able to add any filters. By default, there will be none selected. If we click on edit filters, we get to this tab. And here you're able to choose the asset we just configured in asset type configurations within Insight. So I've chosen active devices here, and this will filter the av available objects within this custom field. So a quick example of this in action within a IT service desk project is for example, I created a request that has the summary CPU slow, and we see under affected devices, I've chosen front desk PC. And this has been chosen from a list of every single object within Insight that meets the IQL statement I previously configured. And now if we look into the issue view within the service desk project, we see that we can find the affected devices underneath the, in the right sidebar. If we click on that, we get into this view and this basically lists all the attributes of the given object. And if we click on the key, we are brought into a new tab, which takes us back into Insight and it'll give us the object view within Insight. And here at the bottom, notice that under connected Jira issues, we have the issue we just created. And one additional way we can connect Jira with Insight is through post functions made within the workflow. And this is done when, uh, this is done when statuses are transitioned. 
sure you guys are familiar with the post function process. So I'll just go over the, what the inside post functions actually do. So here within the create post function page, we're able to select the inside post function option. And from there, we have two options for the specific inside post function. The first one is setting a JIRA field with an attribute value from a selected object. And what this does is it takes a target field within the JIRA issue. So I chose here affected hardware and it assigns it the value determined by the attribute value, for example, name within the object that is referenced in the asset field affected devices. The second option for the post function is to set the value of an object attribute with a predefined value. So this takes the object that is currently linked within Insight. So for example, affected devices, and it, you choose a status, so you choose an attribute name, which I chose status, and you set that to a predefined value. So finally, you guys might be wondering what's a real life example of Insight. So a British healthcare services company had previously found issues with being able to determine what medical devices were not working properly or what needed to be upkept. And they found that their uh, system to manage this was incredibly slow and inefficient. Once they were able to use Insight, they were able to manage hundreds and thousands of inter internal and external assets within the database. And so nowadays when they look at incident and change management within their systems, they're able to properly allocate the reg requisite assets to be able to fix any issues that arise. And that's all for my interview on Insight An Asset Management. I'm gonna pass it back to Irene and she will talk about plans within Jira Service Management. Thank you very much, Justin. Sounds really useful a tool. So we definitely, I think it's worth to take a look and uh, make use at the work. Uh, so next, uh, so we now that we have here about uh, all these new features and uh, it looks all like uh, very useful and uh, you may wonder what well, it's a cloud for people who have not migrated to cloud and the new to cloud, you may be wondering what are the plans that Atlassian has to offer. So we can take the, we can take this opportunity and uh, look at look at the plans together. So for cloud version, Atlassian offer the free standard premium enterprise. So there are four different plans. And of course, each plan we will have its uh, limitations. We can take a look. Here I already opened up uh, a bigger screen so that we can take a look together. Uh, you can see on the left side, uh, it lists all the details of the features and then you can compare which features are available or not available in which particular plan so that you can make a more informed decision like uh, which plan would be most suitable for your team. And uh, you also be able through this, uh, on this page, you also be able to find out the pricing of, uh, it could be the monthly, if you decided the monthly subscription will be uh, more suitable, for, uh, provide you the better price for your team, or you like to subscribe to the annual pricing, right? So the good thing about the annual subscription is you, you get a 12 months license, but you only need to pay 10 months. So you can do some calculation, make the best decision for your team. But like I say, this will be a very useful page to get you some idea or features you need and then choose the collect plan for your team. But if you have uh, um, any questions, so feel free. We are always here. Let me drag this one over. I don't know what is this, why it's blocking this. All right. All right. Like, if you have any licensing questions, feel free to contact uh, uh, us. So send us an email, info at dragonagile.com, and I will be happy to assist you and answer any questions about your licensing, how to help you safe. Okay, um, good. So next, I'm going to hand over to Power. Let's hear what he has to share with us best practice, how he uses, what are the common, like, a, like a useful tips at work. Power, yeah, feel free to take over. 
Thank you, Irene. Um, thank you guys for presenting Ops Genie and uh, automation and, and uh, insights. So um, um, I can tell you just um, uh, as a quick uh, example, we have used insights uh, before in our, so we have multiple JIRA instances. Uh, we have a JIRA um, a data center instance and we've used that. And um, I, I, I'm really uh, impressed with the availability of it on cloud. Uh, we haven't used it in, in the same way that you presented, but there's lots of different use cases for that. And Ops Genie, we're actually looking uh, into that as well, um, but uh, a little bit more in my presentation. So um, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Do you want to take over? Oh, I can, yeah, do, I can I, uh, do that for you. I, okay. I'm pretty sure I, I requested okay, it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Perfect. No, no, no problem. Um, so I think this should give me control. Yeah, there we go. Um, so what problems does it solve for me uh, for Jira service management? Um, so it, it does a lot of things for, for me and for our teams. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, many uh, different Jira instances, but uh, the Jira cloud instance is where I'm uh, mostly in uh, today. Um, and uh, I got to say, I, I was really uh, initially uh, more of a Jira server person, but I got to say Jira Cloud has uh, really moved forward uh, and gotten a lot better. And uh, Jira service management is helping us solve a lot of our problems to simplify support for IT uh, internal uh, tools. Uh, so uh, we use a Jira service management project uh, if, if there's a approval process uh, required for an NDA project access. Uh, modifications. Um, we need to have somebody approve that uh, and Jira service management does that very well for us. It uh, allows us to send uh, a request to the uh, to the viewer, uh, to, to, sorry, to the approver and uh, and uh, once they verify in their notes that, uh, that uh, access can be granted to that user, uh, it is uh, then uh, proceeded with, uh, with uh, an approval and gives us the ability to uh, give the user access that they need. Uh, so for ND8 projects, so non-disclosure agreement projects, um, and many of you probably have them as well. Uh, the approval process uh, basically gives us an audit trail um, and the ability to, to um, track of who has access. Um, work prioritization, uh, great tool for prioritizing work. I'm currently uh, working on migrating my uh, middleware team into uh, Jira service management project. It will allow us to have um, our end users uh, to have the ability to uh, send in requests and we can prioritize them and work on them. Uh, and the approval process for some of the larger projects uh, will come in handy as well. Automation is another problem uh, solver tool that uh, Jira Service Management has. Uh, it gives us the ability to automate um, things such as high priority tickets. So uh, that's one of the examples. I have a slide down uh, or two, where if we have a high priority issue that is uh, that is logged, uh, I've set up an automation that uh, that provides us. Um, uh, the ability to to get an email notification uh, that uh, basically lets us see uh, not all the time are we logged into Jira, um, so we don't see it, but everyone has uh, their Outlook open all the time and they see notifications pop up right away. Um, knowledge base integration. So uh, we integrate our Jira um, service management project with Confluence. So for some of the um, uh, requests. Uh, we basically have um, documentation as to how to uh, proceed uh, and it gives them the ability to self-serve, uh, which is really important. Uh, it reduces the amount of tickets that are logged and it improves um, our ability to support them faster. Um, high visibility project support. So our level two support has, um, this is a different Jira service uh, management project. Uh, they have uh, support um, set up through Jira service management. So level one uh, logs a ticket to level two through Jira service management uh, or end users um, log them. And uh, 
they take care of them as, as quickly as possible. Um, one of the things is SLAs. It's really important to make sure that uh, we return uh, or service our customer uh, as, as quickly as possible, or at least let them know, hey, we're looking into something. Uh, we want to be able to, uh, to um, uh, help them as, as quickly as possible. Automation helps us out uh, or helps them out uh, as well. Uh, it, uh, it notifies them of high, high uh, priority tickets. Um, IT teams integration with uh, Jira software projects. So uh, what we've done is uh, we've integrated uh, the Jira service management project with our uh, Jira software project. So our development teams are able to get a copy of, of the problem or incident and link it directly into the Jira service management and have that integration uh, with automation uh, work together uh, to um, have a high visibility uh, to, to the project and they can uh, choose to, uh, to uh, make notes directly into the service management project or just internal ones uh, for, for the IT teams or development teams. Uh, again, uh, knowledge base integration is, is key. Uh, integrating with Confluence allows uh, the level two support to uh, reduce the amount of tickets that are going to, uh, to uh, development teams and to understand uh, better as to what our uh, known issues are and uh, let the customer know that we know of, of the issue and um, we are moving forward with it. And as well uh, reporting. So uh, management is always interested in reporting. Um, reporting for our level two support team is, is uh, critical uh, to make sure that uh, we have enough staff um, or, or there's enough training that's been done. We can see uh, what type of issues have been um, open longer and what type of issues have been open shorter and what the reasons are so we can dig into that um, a little bit deeper. So why Jira service management? I think I've um, sort of given you a little bit of an overview, but uh, uh, we deliver value faster because um, uh, we have uh, the ability to uh, go across teams and and uh, empowers the teams to, uh, to uh, be more flexible and um, reduce the... Um, cost of legacy ITSM tools. Um, we also use other tools such as uh, Remedy for some incident management, but um, if, if you guys have ever used Remedy, it's, it's an amazing tool, but uh, it's quite outdated and uh, just the cost of maintaining it is, is uh, quite difficult. With Jira service management, it's, it's much easier uh, to maintain it um, and simple to set up. Um, the request types uh, for agents and for the request forms for, for the other users are, um, are very helpful, uh, very easy to, uh, to uh, manage. Uh, we make work visible, more visible, uh, an open collaborative platform that brings greater visibility to work across different teams and to, uh, to the end user, uh, which is critical for us. Um, very helpful. Instantaneous updates, um, as you know, you can um, you can set up different uh, notifications through Jira Service Desk. So um, either through uh, the app uh, on your phone or through email, you get uh, constant updates, and you're constantly knowing where you are. And automation that uh, allows escalation to other Jira projects. Um, so we have uh, in our workflow in, in our Jira service management for certain issue types, uh, the ability to escalate to other projects and uh, uh, with the help of automation, uh, which is again, a great tool uh, uh, with Jira service management to be able to, uh, to um, uh, escalate more quickly and uh, have issues resolved faster. Um, feedback and reporting is, is also uh, very um, useful in Jira service management. Uh, we get uh, continuous feedback from satisfaction surveys. Uh, we basically take that and we try to improve. We try to grow uh, as, as a team. 
reporting that allows for workload management and planning. So uh, we use these reports to, to uh, make sure that we have enough staff uh, for specific things, especially around uh, deployments. If there are deployments of the product, um, we make sure that uh, we follow up to make sure that uh, that there is no um, high priority incidents, um, anything like that. And uh, we have enough staff to actually manage them. Uh, reporting for SLA, uh, met versus breach. So we try to minimize the amount of breached SLAs and uh, the reporting helps us do that. Um, and then filter-based queries. So uh, some examples of filter-based queries in our Jira service management projects are uh, for monitoring. So when we have our monitoring tools reporting back to Jira, uh, they basically create a ticket and uh, they go into the monitoring queue um, escalated. So anything that's been escalated by either a customer or another user, uh, we have a queue for that. Uh, things are unassigned. Uh, it's always easier to find an, ass unassi an unassigned ticket uh, in a queue than it is to look through all the tickets and then see which one uh, I can work on if, if uh, such thing. Uh, we have a queue for UAT and prod issues. So uh, whether it's a production issue or UAT, uh, we want to know and prioritize our production issues over uh, UAT, but if there's a critical deployment that's just about to happen and somebody finds an issue in the UAT environment, we may want to look at what else we have in production um, and um, add more, more um, support uh, to, to the UAT issue uh, while maintaining the production issue. And then, um, some issues all, uh, may require an RCA, which is uh, uh, which is uh, inevitable in today's world. We may need to uh, know what the root cause of, of an incident is. So we have a queue for that, uh, for higher priority issues. And then automation, how do we use it? Um, I've mentioned some of the ways, but uh, here are some of the other uh, ways. Um, approval from project leads for access to our non-disclosure agreement projects. Um, that's that's very valuable for us. Um, adding watchers to linked issues. So um, for some uh, projects, uh, we may want uh, certain people watching uh, the issue. Uh, or the linked issues. Uh, so we have a, an automation job for that. Um, notifying a signee when an SLA is close to breach uh, gives them an opportunity if they're not uh, super busy on, on a higher priority issue to be able to visit or at least to let the customer know, hey, we're, we're looking into this. Uh, it's just, um, it may be delayed for, for whatever reason. Um, uh, reopen issues when a uh, comment is added. Uh, that's one of the nice thing is uh, sometimes uh, some of the, the Jira server, uh, Jira um, service management projects uh, issues um, don't reopen the tickets automatically. We've built an automation for that, especially if a customer writes a specific comment in there. Um, auto resolve issues that have been uh, inactive for a longer period of time. So six months as an example. Uh, UAT feedback, uh, which um, allows us to, uh, to um, provide a specific team the feedback tickets that are created uh, with specific things that uh, are in summary. For example, if they put UAT in the, in the summary, it uh, basically directs it to the correct person. Um, auto close duplicate uh, issues. Uh, if somebody marks uh, a ticket duplicate, um, it uh, may be automatically closed. Um, close parent issues when all subtasks are completed. This is more for Jira software, uh, where if a story um, has subtasks and all the subtasks are closed, it, uh, it allows the automation to uh, auto close the completed uh, parent issue. So the story in this particular case. And uh, latency alerts uh, from monitoring tools. Um, it uh, notifies um, the specific uh, people of the of the priority of uh, of the latency alerts uh, that uh, may be reported by the tool. So, um, Irene, um, that's uh, all for me. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. 
You're thank next. You. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Power, to share uh, your best practice and how you use it at your work. So that could be that could be applied to many other customer like users that uh, that they can make use in in their projects and in their organization. So great. So before we move to the end, I also want to talk a uh, touch on a little bit about cloud migration. I know that. Like, uh, Many people may still on server and on prem, and Atlassian has stopped uh, selling any new uh, server licenses. And uh, the support for server version will also going to be end in two or three years. So it may be time to think about to migrate to cloud. So, but then what are the options out there if? If you are planning to migrate your Jira service management project from server to cloud, so right now in uh, uh, up to now that Atlassian has a tool. It's called uh, Atlassian Cloud uh, Migration Assistant, but this tool uh, currently it's not uh, available to support the Jira service management cloud migration. But if you are planning to move whole site you know, from server to a brand new cloud instance, there is still one option there. You do a site import so that it's still possible. But, but uh, the good news is that my uh, Atlassian Cloud Migration Assistant tool will be available uh, for Jira Service Management Project Migration uh, within this year. So some we just need to keep an eye out and uh, keep and hopefully it'll be available soon. Then it, it will just make a cloud migration much easier. But for now, like say, still available, still possible with the site import. So just uh, want to inform people if you are planning to do the cloud migration. 